you know business. How it takes something special to bring it to life. To help it grow and expand. To reach more marketplaces, more customers, and to reach its own broad potential. But the only way businesses big or small can move forward is to work together. They need to be able to understand each other anywhere in the world. In other words, business requires a common language, and we make that possible. GS1 standards are the global language of business, a language for identifying, capturing, and sharing information automatically and accurately, so that everyone who wants that information can understand it, no matter who or where they are. At GS1, we make it possible to follow the food we eat from the field to the distributor to the store and know that it got there fresh. We make it possible to track medication and medical devices as they move from the manufacturer to the distribution center to the hospital to the patient and trust that they're authentic. And we make it possible for the right product to be in the right place at the right time, and for everyone to trust that the information they see about that product is correct. When businesses work together, they can move their inventory efficiently and safely. At GS1, we bring business together to envision the future and agree on how to get there. So all around the world, business runs better. The things we need are safer. Life is a little bit easier all because the world of business runs on GS1 standards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Bob Carpenter. I have always wanted to do that. Michael T. and the GS1 Connect Band, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic. You guys have been great. Hey, so welcome to Vegas, huh? Everyone having a good time? So uh, thank you very much for uh, investing a few days of your time to come out and join us at GS1 Connect 2012. The, uh, the attendance has been a, uh, a record for us, over uh, almost 1,400 people here this afternoon, so that's fantastic. And uh, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, spend a few days and talk about collaboration, because we think right now collaboration is a very, very important subject in light of all the uncertainty that we have in the world, of all the uh, challenging business problems that you face today. And we're going to talk about some of those in the next uh, 90 minutes that we spend together. So let's talk a little bit about uh, working together and uh, what it means to work together as an industry to push things forward. And, you know, really our influence, our strength, really stems from all of you here in the audience and the other 248,000 members that comprise GS1 US. So you play a very, very critical role in how we move forward together as an industry. Because together, you provide the diversity of thinking, diversity of background, but most importantly, a willingness to help us move forward on opportunities that are important to industry, which are very, very, uh, very, very key to our success. And as you think about together, how do, we, how do we move things forward to get the results that we need as a group? Well, at GS1 US, we like to think that we, in essence, work with industry leaders to help them envision the future, exemplify best practices, and engage their communities. And oftentimes, we really do that as it starts with an initial group of first movers, pioneers, thought leaders, that come together around a, a basic business concept, a business requirement, a business process, that they see an opportunity to make an industry standard. And over time, that idea grows, and more people get involved. And eventually, it becomes an industry standard that's used by everyone. But the process of moving that idea along 
Scaling that idea needs scaffolding, needs support, needs governance, needs technology insight. And that's where we believe GS1 US plays a critical role in providing that governance to help industry leaders work together and move forward. Because for us, success is really measured by taking that initial idea and making it available to be implemented by companies of all kinds and all sizes. Because with standards, nothing short of 100% implementation will do. And so for us, it's absolutely critical that we work with industry to help companies implement broad-scale solutions that address those business requirements that deliver on the promise that you've asked us to deliver on for standards development. This slide behind me, behind me looks at scale and efficiency. And to your right, you're right, that's right. To your right, you see this uh, initial group of thought leaders, these pioneers that come together to work on an initial idea or business requirement. And then all the way to your left, the concept of adoption and full scale. But why is 100% adoption so important for what we do? Well, we think without 100% adoption, the economies of scale and efficiency in information standards, in core business processes, are significantly limited. And so consequently, we hear from you that the core benefit that you look for from GS1 US is reaching those economies of scale, efficiency, but most importantly, driving growth. And so what you see behind me is what was once a new idea with those thought leaders and pioneers on the far right becomes a norm for the industry over time. Thanks, we would believe, to the leadership that we provide through GS1 US. So let's shift gears and talk a little bit about the two products that we provide. First, industry standards, where we come together and we sit down with those thought leaders, those pioneers, and we ask them, what problem are you trying to solve? What are the business requirements in order to solve that problem? What kind of business processes are we trying to improve? And most importantly, can we take GS1 standards to make those business processes work faster, less expensively, more reliably? That's the industry standards work that we do. But our job isn't done after that, because there's a second critical component that we have to get right, which is around company solutions. Because any industry standard that we develop that isn't implemented by industry doesn't deliver on the ROI for you. So we work through our OneSync business unit to provide advisory and professional services work, education and training out of our Dayton facility to make sure, in partnership with solution providers, that we get that implementation, that last mile, accomplished. And we believe that these two groups have a lot in common. They work very interdependently with one another. So we have to do both very well to deliver on that promise with you. Let's talk about how we're going to spend the balance of our time this afternoon. So the first portion of the conversation, uh, I'm going to quickly update you on our progress in five key industry verticals at GS1 US. And as part of that conversation, we're privileged to be joined by two individuals from Darden and McKesson to talk about progress in the food service and the healthcare industry, respectively. And then the second portion of the conversation, we're going to shift gears a little bit and look forward and talk about B to B to C. And for that conversation, we're pleased, we're privileged and fortunate to have uh, three individuals from Peapod, eBay, and at Walmart Labs that are going to join me on the stage for a panel discussion on the topics and how, those, uh, how their companies are addressing those opportunities. So let's get started. Looking at first consumer packaged goods and grocery. This is one of our most mature, one of our most established industry verticals, really was the cornerstone of the foundation of the Uniform Code Council in 1973. And if we look at what this industry is focused on, it's largely about improving product data quality to share accurate product information for physical and digital commerce. And this started with really a fundamental question around data quality, initially in the order to cash business process, turning off the paper, using EDI, embedding GS1 keys in EDI messaging so that we could get that reconciliation process right, which was really the foundation of new ways of working together. But 10 years ago, something else happened. The industry came to us and said, how about new product introductions and product changes? And how do we, how do we uh, automate and improve that process on a one-to-many basis? And that led to the launch of the Global Data Synchronization Network. And those are the two thrusts of what we work on in the consumer packaged goods industry. So for us, around data quality, we've been serving you, the industry, 
First, through our Dayton facility, where we helped over 11,000 companies last year deal with issues around verifying their G10, authenticating a company prefix, or talking about weights and measures or G10 allocation rules. We have over 2,000 companies up and running on the data accuracy scorecard, thanks to our OneSync business unit. We have over 30 engagements that have already been completed by our advisory and professional services team in the area of data quality, benchmarking, auditing data quality, offering insights around data governance as well. So the story here really is we need to take control of the quality of our data, and that's particularly important now because disruptions in the supply chain are critical, but now those disruptions are visible to the consumer with an added liability. And we'll talk more about that in the B2C discussion. Let's shift gears and talk about the uh, general merchandise apparel segment. This is a very important segment for GS1 US, comprises about 45% of our membership. And what's interesting in this group is the initial focus was really around following products from the source to store, ensuring that the right product is in the right place at the right time. Not a terribly new concept, but what we discovered is when we first started to look at inventory accuracy and improving inventory accuracy for retail apparel, uh, uh, retail apparel organizations, what we discovered is that provided a whole other level of capability where we allowed them to actually have visibility upstream through their supply chain, automating receiving, automating shipping, improving overall response times. So now with heightened inventory accuracy at 95%, we could demand forecast and we could respond quickly to that. So it's led to a whole new transformation in the uh, general merchandise apparel supply chain. If we look at the key focus areas, two things. First, our EPC item level readiness programs that we're uh, leading through GS1 US. And then secondly, a tremendous amount of industry engagement work in partnership with our, 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 our group, the VIX agency, or the VIX organization. And the results have been nothing short of, of extraordinary, quite frankly. What we've seen thus far is, is rapid adoption of tag sales. Uh, in 2011, VDC research estimates that over 1 billion tags were sold. In 2015, they're estimating it's going to be 47 billion. We know of three retailers in the U.S. right now that are chain-wide implementation programs for RFID across 5,400 stores. And one of those retailers alone has purchased 50,000 readers. Most importantly, we know of one um, retail apparel group that has seen their inventory accuracy improve from 63% to 95%, sustainable over time. They've reduced their out-of-stocks by 50%. And most importantly, they've improved their item count per hour from 200 items to over 12,000 items. So now I can take inventory twice a month versus twice a year. So the benefits are extraordinary. This is moving very quickly. And I would urge you, if you're not involved, please reach out and get in touch with one of our people so that we can get you integrated and ready for a request that's likely to come from your retailer soon. Let's talk about fresh foods. This is an industry that historically, uh, the perimeter of the store, has not adopted GS1 standards as fast as the, uh, the core, the, uh, the internal part of the store. But based upon regulation, this is happening very quickly now. Um, and this industry really has come to us talking about tracing and tracking product and the food we eat, improving efficiency and enhancing safety for consumers. Based upon efforts with the Food Safety Modernization Act that was put into law in January 2011, it stipulated the need for key data elements and critical tracking events, which sounds a lot like the identify and the capture components of our identify capture share strategy. So where we've been focusing is really on integrating all sorts of different segments in the fresh food category. Seafood, meat and poultry, dairy, produce. Acknowledging the differences in their supply chain, but also driving for a standards-based approach that, that delivers interoperability between food service and retail grocery. Working across different associations. Working with the FDA, who's going to uh, regulate around traceability guidelines here in the next six to 12 months, and the Institute of Food Technology. Also getting this industry to agree on common use of standards, technologies to identify product, location, and extended dating, like lot and batch information. And the success thus far has been really terrific. We've seen in a recent produce traceability initiative audit that 92% of brand owners are assigning a GTIN or plan to in the next six months. 63% of, of brand owner suppliers plan to read or are already reading the GS1-128, and 75% of recipients are planning to read or are already reading the GS1-128 
on uh, receiving of their product. So great, pro great progress, and again, we would urge you, in light of the pending regulation around the Food Safety Modernization Act, please get involved. Moving on to food service. This is a category that came to us in 2009 and really looked for uh, some basic help around sharing accurate product information everyone can rely on, improving efficiency, and food safety. Three key things they asked us to focus on. Please, reduce inefficiencies in our business, improve food safety and traceability, and enhance the integrity of the, of the information, product information shared within retail partners. So since 2009, we've increased the number of companies involved to 85. We've improved overall the progress of getting upwards of 75% of the industry revenue to be shared through the help of GS1 standards. And the manufacturer and the distributors are well on their way. We have over 2,000 companies already using the GDSN, the Global Data Synchronization Network, up from 109 in 2009. Tremendous progress. And anecdotally, we hear repeatedly great success stories about companies that are automating their receiving, their shipping, their warehouse management systems to take out labor, reduce costs, and improve accuracy. So again, we would urge you to get involved in that initiative as well. So now we've prepared a short video that we'd like to share with you that helps to provide a little more context on the food service industry. And then after that video, I'm going to be joined by Jim Thomas from the Darden organization so that he can share some thoughts from their group. So if we could show the video, please. Each year, food service companies waste hundreds of hours reviewing and reconciling inaccurate supply chain data. A single widespread recall can cost an industry sector over $10 million a day and put a business out of business. An estimated 5% of shipments from distributors to operators are refunded or returned annually. But that's all changing. By working together, we're transforming the way food service does business. We're creating greater integration, enabling visibility across the supply chain. We're streamlining business processes, improving efficiency, and eliminating waste. We're helping to provide accurate information to trading partners, and ultimately, consumers. We're creating a foundation for reliable food safety. Using GS1 standards, we're moving business forward, together. So I'm thrilled to uh, introduce Jim Thomas, who's the Vice President of Supply Chain for the Darden Restaurants Group. Jim, thanks for joining us. And, Thank uh, you, Bob. Good luck. <laughs> thanks, everyone. First, let me start by reminding you in the audience that I'm a restaurant guy not a public speaker. So you can be critical of the content, but not of the delivery. First, let me tell you why I'm here and why I can talk to you about this. I've been with Darden for 12 years. I have responsibilities in purchasing and supply chain management. I'm also the executive sponsor, along with a peer that you may know, Anna Hooper, who is our vice president of total quality for Darden as well. And uh, we provide leadership to an organization across Darden who is trying to engage in the industry uh, the standards that we're talking about here today. Let me start by asking you a question, and it's a serious question. If you can raise your hands if you love your family, just a quick show of hands. Well, this is easy then, you obviously know our brands. We are Red Lobster, Olive Garden, Bahama Breeze, Seasons 52, Capitol Grill, and Eddie V's Restaurants. In fiscal 2011, we ranked 342nd on Darden's Fortune 500 list. We collectively employ about 180,000 people and serve 400 million meals a year to your family as well. With that scale, we're the 27th largest employer in America in the private sector. And we believe we've been able to enjoy that growth and success due to our strong, people-oriented, guest-focused culture that can be traced all the way back to Bill Darden's first restaurant that was called the Green Frog, and its motto was service with a hop. 
case you're ever asked that in a Trivial Pursuit question. So why do we need industry standards? First, food safety is not a competitive advantage. We believe in the restaurant space and the food service space that food safety is an imperative, it's not a choice. And data standards further are just good business. Cost pressures require the food service industry to increase its competitiveness as well. Data standards drive benefits based on critical mass. Critical mass is more than Darden alone. Even with our scale at seven and a half billion in sales, we represent less than 8% of restaurant sales in the United States. So we need everyone to participate to get critical mass. Darden and other large operators are gonna use these standards to base our own trading partner requirements. There's a lot of other operators who've been engaged in this initiative for a number of years. I saw Brenda Lloyd earlier at the uh, conference. She's here from Yum, and you probably know Yum's brands if you, again, love your families with Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and a few others. We also work with Brenda and other operators to work with the FDA on educating regulators about the possibilities that standards can give the industry to protect guests and consumers. And we believe together we can lower costs, eliminate waste, add more value, and provide more affordable food to more people. Let me start by telling you the problem that we face. Imagine if you're a supplier and you provide food. Food is agricultural. Nature makes food. Nature doesn't follow the rules. Nature doesn't have standards. So our manufacturers, as good as they are, face problems every day. So imagine there's a, a foodborne illness, something that they couldn't protect themselves from and they need to stop the supply chain. They call our warehouse providers and tell them of a product number that has to be stopped. Those warehouse providers then have to look in their records and they have to tell the distributors. We, as a, uh, a chain operator, have only four grocery distributors that we would work with. Those grocery distributors have to translate that number from the warehouse providers. And then they have to call the restaurants, our operators, who receive that product. That sounds more like a rumor than a recall. After GS1 standards are implemented, it's our hope that we can have one number that we can tell one number to our trading partners with a lot and batch number that is not encrypted, with a lot and batch number that can immediately be shared with all the trading partners, instantaneously avoid translation errors, get accurate information immediately into the hands of the operators. And I think that's important because my family eats at our restaurants. If a manufacturer is aware of a natural event that is causing potential harm to guests, I don't want my family be, to be the one in the restaurant waiting for a translation. So what is GS1's impact on the supply chain? It enables us, I have to be careful not to push the black button while I open this. Um, it enables us to easily identify product, capture and share information, to quickly communicate that information with all the trading partners, regardless whether those are company restaurants or franchise restaurants globally. We want to rapidly respond to a food safety crisis to ensure guest safety. And we can create better supply and demand information as well, driving efficiencies at the same time. Darden is going to grow. It's very clear that we're going to grow in restaurants, we're going to grow in guests, we're going to grow in geographies, and we're going to grow in complexity. End-to-end -end supply chain visibility doesn't have to add to that complexity. It can simplify that complexity. GS1 lays the foundation for those initiatives. Our ability to lower expenses is also foundational with the GS1 standards. We can automate restaurant receiving practices, reduce labor expenses in our own restaurants. It'll help us to expand unattended deliveries in our restaurants and manage expenses. We believe that the business case associated with the work we're doing in the restaurants is easily translatable upstream into the warehouses and manufacturing environments that support our restaurants. And we believe, as you've seen in the video from Bob, that in-restaurant inventory management can also be enhanced, providing more accuracy in our replenishment processes. 
So for us, this is about integrity. One best way to interact with Darden, regardless if you're a manufacturer of produce, beef products, chicken, seafood globally, we'll give you one standard to work with us, and it'll happen to be a global standard for food service, a global standard for produce, a global standard for beef. That'll make interactions with the world's largest casual dining company easy and not complicated. We'll enable system-wide traceability. We'll have visibility. I liken this to the approach of if you walk into a room and the lights are out, you can certainly make it across the room. But wouldn't it be better to have visibility? Let's turn the lights on and let everybody see what's happening. We believe we can manage key data components that enable our traceability initiatives. We also believe we can make better decisions when all of the supply chain partners have the data available to them instantly, as in the recall example versus the rumor example. We can drive better decision making in the supply chain. We can drive more full trucks. We can make more timely deliveries, all because we have better information. And we can share that information with our consumers. What do we need from our suppliers? What do we need from the food service industry? We need you to uh, adopt the standards and join the initiative. Our operators demand it, our supply chain partners demand it, and our guests demand it. So we need our supply community to acquire GS1 company prefixes, get global location numbers for their headquarters, any billing location or shipping location that will sell to Darden, assign product codes in accordance with the G10 standards, and prepare the barcode. In the food service space, we're talking barcode to read and share data through electronic commerce as well and electronic ASNs, or advanced ship notice, and engage the right people in your organization to get this done now. And I'll leave you with this last comment. As Henry Ford told us, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. It's time to move. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Jim. Let's move on and talk a little bit about healthcare. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that I think we have over 200 participants from healthcare for the healthcare track this time, which is a, a real great number. So thank you for joining us. In healthcare, the focus has really been around following medication and medical devices from the manufacturer to the patient in order to improve efficiency, safety, and patient care. And there's really been two major drivers that have been pushing this. The first has been economics. Reimbursement rates in the United States are driving extraordinary change in providers and wholesalers around how they use information, how they improve business processes, how they can leverage standards to become more efficient so they can remain financially sustainable and survive. And there's also a regulatory component of this. We know pedigree is coming in 2015. We know the unique device identification legislation is forthcoming any day. And the US pharmaceutical companies are working on traceability guidelines as well. So there's a strong impetus to come together as an industry from those regulatory benefits as well. And our focus has really been around continuing to get the community involved. We have over 145 companies in the United States, but more importantly, we've leveraged our global network of GS1 member organizations in many countries, 30 to be exact, around the world, where there's a healthcare group that's engaged and a global organization out of our Brussels organization, which has been fantastic. And the results thus far have been great. We have over 2,600 companies that are ready to use the GLN, the global location number, and over 375,000 locations loaded in our GLN registry already. Over 1,000 companies are ready to assign GTINs, given the sunrise date of 2012 for GTINs, and over 160, or 360,000, excuse me, GTINs already loaded into the global data synchronization network. But the story I really like to tell is about a provider you've probably heard about called Mayo in uh, Minnesota and many other places that recently announced that they're moving over $725 million through the help of the GLN in their supply chain. $725 million. And when you think about the fact that many of those transactions that happen in the supply chain without a GLN are prone to be done incorrectly. And correcting them can cost anywhere from $100 to $400 per invoice. So we can quick, quickly extrapolate the value that Mayo is receiving from conducting over $725 million error-free through the help of the global location number, which has been fantastic. 
So those are the kind of stories that we continue to hear of for healthcare, and we would urge you, if you're not involved in this initiative, to please get involved. So here again, we have a short video that helps to provide a little more context on what's happening in healthcare. And then after that, I'm going to ask Mark Walcher, president of McKesson Specialty Health, to join me on the stage and talk a little bit about what McKesson's doing in the healthcare space. So if we could play the video, please. Preventable medication errors have serious effects on 7.1 million patients annually and cost the industry $21 billion each year. Counterfeit drugs are infiltrating the global supply chain more frequently than ever. Recently, a fake cancer drug was purchased by 19 hospitals and medical centers in the United States. Inefficiencies in supply chain information cost the healthcare industry two to five billion dollars each year. But that's all changing. By working together, we're transforming the way healthcare operates. We're making it possible to follow drugs and medical devices from the manufacturer to the patient and trust that they're authentic. We're enabling supply chain visibility, lowering costs through increased efficiency and delivering accurate information. We're improving patient care and safety, reducing medication errors and linking critical product data to a patient's record. We're facilitating more effective product recalls, making it harder for counterfeit products to get to patients and supporting regulatory compliance. Using GS1 standards, we're moving healthcare forward together. Good afternoon. Nice to hear that there's some healthcare folks in the audience. A little shout out to uh, some of my healthcare colleagues out there. I'm not sure what happened though. Bob gets kind of the whole band. He gets the David Letterman welcome. <laughs> and then he introduces Jim, and then I just have to walk up by myself. I'm not, I'm not sure. Sure, I guess I, uh, I drew the, the, the bad straw here. But uh, really a, a privilege for me to have an opportunity to spend some time uh, with, with you all this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Walchirk. I'm with McKesson Corporation. I work in our McKesson Specialty Health uh, Business Unit. And for those of you that uh, know uh, uh, McKesson, um, you probably have, it, or, or those, of, those of us that are part of healthcare probably have heard of McKesson, but those of you that perhaps aren't part of healthcare may not have heard of, of McKesson Corporation. And we like to uh, kind of tell people that we're one of the largest companies that perhaps you've, uh, you've never heard of. McKesson really stands in kind of the center of healthcare. We're, uh, we don't have really a consumer brand, but we provide products and services really across the entire uh, healthcare continuum. And you can see some of just kind of the facts and figures up here. Uh, we really report out in, in two primary segments, uh, distribution solutions, which is really kind of the core of McKesson Corporation over time, and really our core business being pharmaceutical and medical supply distribution, and then technology solutions, which is really our business focused on uh, healthcare information systems uh, and the use of, of software, clinical software in, in hospitals, uh, in physicians' offices, uh, et cetera. And I just want to take a minute again to talk a little bit about McKesson, then maybe talk a little bit about healthcare, and then maybe talk more specifically about why GS1 is such a critical uh, element into healthcare and why McKesson is such a big uh, supporter and proponent of, uh, of the GS1 uh, standards. So at McKesson, as I said, we're really a healthcare services company. We, we hope to, to think about standing at the center and working with all the various stakeholders in healthcare to really help them run and operate their businesses more efficiently. So whether it's a, a retail pharmacy chain or a, 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 a payer or a physician's office or a hospital, we work across the entire supply chain uh, uh, with uh, those, uh, those types of, of entities in, in healthcare. And you can see some of the different things that we do. One of the things we're very proud of, I would highlight here, is really the investment we've made over time in, in, uh, in business process and operational excellence through a Lean Six Sigma effort. And as you think about the the supply chain that McKesson's part of uh, in pharmaceuticals and medical surgical supplies. Obviously, the, the ability to do that very efficiently and, uh, and effectively is very important, and that's really helped us to, uh, to do that. Well, not only do we try to be very efficient in helping our business partners run their operations, but we also think that we have products and services and technology that uh, helps our customers provide better care for their patients. And that really is kind of the ultimate mission that we have by being part of the healthcare industry is really ultimately to help our, 
uh, the, the broad stakeholders in healthcare provide ultimately the best possible patient care that they can. And what we do from a supply chain standpoint and from a technology standpoint and specifically around standards has a huge impact in, in patient safety and ultimately in providing better patient care. So just, that's just a quick uh, flyby uh, on McKesson. I want to maybe talk a little about what's going on in, in healthcare today. Um, for those of you that are in, in healthcare, you, you probably would agree with me that uh, healthcare is probably going through as much change now as it has in quite some time. And I've been part of the healthcare industry for almost 25 years, and I can tell you in my experience, I've never seen the type of rapid change that's taking place in healthcare today. And that's really the result of a variety of things that are going on in healthcare. There is pressure on the healthcare uh, uh, industry in this country from so many different factors, whether it's around cost, whether it's around quality, whether it's regulatory pressure, uh, technology advance advancements, um, and even more importantly these days, the fact that, that patients and consumers have so much more information at their fingertips about healthcare, and that's added a whole new set of uh, complexities uh, to, uh, to the industry. So the industry is facing rapid change and really fr uh, facing pressure on, uh, on many fronts. But with that, I think pressure and, and challenge, frankly, comes opportunities. And as we think about how healthcare will evolve and, and can evolve over the coming years, frankly, the use of technology is going to be critical to uh, impacting better patient care, impacting uh, reduced cost, and, and really the use of standards uh, in, a, in the supply chain and certainly beyond the supply chain is critical in, uh, uh, in exceeding and, and, and meeting those expectations that the stakeholders have. And as all of you know, and certainly has sh been shared before, GS1 really kind of enables all the stakeholders in healthcare to get together uh, um, in, a, in a safe environment, if you will, and really to develop these standards that can drive better efficiency and better uh, patient care. So three key areas, and that Bob touched on it, and I've spoken already about them, patient safety being one, um, supply chain efficiency being the second, and certainly the regulatory compliance. And those are really the three key reasons why McKesson is so uh, committed to uh, the GS1 standards and just being very uh, strong proponents of, of GS1 and, and organizationally what, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and, and, you know, Jim talked a bit about, you know, why he's here or why Darden is, is uh, so supportive of GS1. And I would maybe answer the same question. Uh, I'm, not a, um, I'm not a technologist, uh, I'm not a supply chain expert, I probably know enough about both to be slightly dangerous, but I'm just a, a business person. And I think as we think about healthcare and perhaps some of the other industries that we're in, uh, we need to make sure that as business people we're driving the adoption of these standards. It can't simply come from the technology department or the supply chain department, it really has to come from the overall uh, business and I think that's really one of the key, key things in healthcare that's helped to drive adoption, but certainly uh, how Healthcare needs to continue to adopt these standards going forward. Just a couple of quick things around patient safety. Um, you know, it's a real sad uh, state in this country, but literally thousands of people uh, die every year from what are referred to as, as adverse drug events uh, or errors that take place in a hospital. And uh, that, those numbers have been reduced significantly over the past 10 years due to advances in technology and a real focus on patient safety. But the fact is that there are still adverse drug events that take place uh, every day in, in across healthcare, and really through the use of of, of, uh, of technology, of standards around medication, we can reduce that that number and hopefully, uh, you know, bring that number to zero. You know, Bob touched on uh, counterfeit medications, and I think in the video as well. You know, just a few weeks ago, it was front page news. I think in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal around. Uh, a significant supply of counterfeit medications that are treated, uh, a, a product that's treated in, in the oncology setting uh, got its way out into the marketplace. So even today, we still face challenges with counterfeit medications. And again, the use of, of standards can help drive uh, to ensure patient safety and, and reduce uh, uh, the risk of counterfeit drugs in the marketplace. The second area is around supply chain efficiency. And you know, when we talk about this in, with, in McKesson or with other healthcare stakeholders, we talk about really kind of the patient care aspect of standard adoption, you know, being almost kind of our duty. And if you're in the healthcare space, you know, we have, a, I think, a, a responsibility to, to lead in terms of how we can support uh, better patient care and better patient safety. But also, the business case around the ability to drive efficiencies in your supply chain is clearly there as well through the adoption of, of these standards. 
And certainly some of these things that you see here are things that all of you face every day in the work that you do in your supply chains. But certainly within uh, the healthcare industry, there are literally millions of transactions that take place every day. And frankly, the use of, of standards helps to bring some order to that, that chaos that could uh, exist. It also allows various stakeholders throughout the healthcare industry to talk on a common platform and with a common language, which is very uh, helpful as well. The third area is around regulatory compliance. And certainly, uh, every industry in this room, I'm sure, is facing tougher and tougher uh, regulations and more legislation that affects your business every day. Healthcare, I can tell you, is no exception. And as you probably know, healthcare is one of the most regulated industries, I think, uh, in, in the US. And literally, with a, a swipe of a pen, an entire industry uh, can, can change in terms of what the re requirements are to, to do business in, in healthcare. And I think one of the things that you talk about why uh, our support and we're, we're such a strong proponent at McKesson uh, around GS1 is not only is GS1 talking to you know, companies in the industry, but they're also very involved in engaging the FDA and other regulatory agencies, industry trade groups, et cetera, to try to really bring all the stakeholders to the table, again, in a very kind of safe uh, environment so that, that the regulators can make more informed decisions and that industry, frankly, can help uh, influence and educate uh, the regulators on, on the types of, uh, of work that they're doing. And that results, hopefully, in regulations that are, 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 are more impactful and, and give industry the ability to implement them more effectively. And certainly, as Bob touched on, uh, California pedigree in 2015 is, uh, is a, I think, a good uh, example of that. So just maybe to, uh, to close here, uh, you know, a couple key things. Certainly, at McKesson, you know, we're very focused on uh, helping the industry further the adoption of these standards. And I think it will take a lot of leadership across the, the entire healthcare industry to do that. And there's other great examples out there. Bob mentioned Mayo Clinic. They're part of the Healthcare Transformation Group. There perhaps are some of you represented here today from those organizations. But it's going to take leadership from organizations like that, other industry trade groups, companies like McKesson and others, to really um, uh, talk about, you know, the duty that we have I think from a patient care and patient safety standpoint, but also the business case that we have in terms of how we can make our operations more efficient and more productive, and through the use of the standards, we can, uh, we can certainly do that. So as we think about our support you know, in the short term, it's about how do we drive further adoption in the standards, and certainly longer term, we think about how new, re new regulatory uh, um, requirements will come into fold, how the healthcare industry will continue to evolve and change, and so having GS1, again, at the center to foster and enable those discussions and to bring industry together, uh, we think is crucial, and that's why we're such a strong uh, supporter of this organization. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, really appreciate it. Mark, thanks a lot. So now we're going to shift gears to the, uh, the second chapter of our discussion, and uh, look forward a little further as it relates to B to B to C. And uh, as I said, we're going to be joined shortly by a set of panelists, and we're going to have a little discussion about how different companies are dealing with this. But before we get started, it might be interesting to break down B to B to C, just so we're clear on what we're talking about. So what do we mean by B to B? So B to B is really the traditional sharing of information, master data, weights, measures, size, dimensions, master data exchange between business partners, brand owners and retailers, for example, oftentimes with the help of the Global Data Synchronization Network through EDI, what we've been working on for, frankly, 25, 30 years. B2C looks a little different. Here you have the, the B is the, is the business, obviously. The C is the consumer now. And uh, all of a sudden you have some new, somewhat new, somewhat not so new intermediaries that are, that are in that space, uh, Twitter, Facebook, we've got search engines like Yahoo and Google and Bing. You've got major platform providers like eBay that you're going to hear from this afternoon, Amazon and others. And now all those intermediaries are looking to share information with the consumer as well, creating their own content and, uh, and getting in between that dialogue with the consumer that used to be very controlled through network television, through your package. Now the consumer has a high appetite for information and she can get it from lots of different sources out there. So the way we've looked at this is in, in an existing universe 
and an emerged universe. I won't say emerging because it's already emerged. And in the existing universe, this is a space that should be, should be pretty familiar to us. The pain points are around the labor cost of managing bad data and disruptions in the supply chain, and the, the benefits are around automation and interoperability. The emerging universe offers some different benefits, though. The pain points here are a little different in that, yes, we have bad data, but now we're trying to manage all that data across multiple channels, omni-channel. We have so many more touch points and stakeholders who, who see and use and leverage that data in our business than we had ever before. And the consumer really is in charge, right? Consumers' adoption of technology oftentimes well surpasses industry's adoption of technology. And so now consumers' adoption of that technology really guides how we need to catch up in many cases. And the benefits are more around consumer trust, brand loyalty, and really revenue growth. And so data quality really means different things in different groups. In the case of, of the existing universe, data quality is something that's still reasonably private, business to business, oftentimes a little transparency driven through a uh, one sync data accuracy scorecard, perhaps. But the, the improvements in that data quality are reasonably gradual between trading partners. But data quality in that B2C space is very public, very transparent. And the time that the consumer allows for us to fix that data quality is immediate, no time at all. They're absolutely unforgiving for quality of data that isn't accurate, isn't up to standard. And so now what we're trying to think about is how do we leverage GS1 standards across that entire continuum, across this continuum. Because this is the world we live in today, right? B2B, B2C. And the question in the dialogue we're having with all of you now, our customers, is what's your enterprise information strategy? How are you migrating to a single item file or a single source of the truth to reduce unnecessary touch points, data disruptions, but more importantly, delight and satisfy a consumer at the moment of truth with high integrity information. And so our approach thus far at GS1 US has been to go to our traditional identify, capture, share framework. And I'll start with the share and work back to identify. In the share bucket, we've really been focused on three key things. First, our product data management strategy through our one sync business unit. Product data management looks not just at data synchronization anymore, but how do we aggregate data? structured and unstructured data, social media data. How do we aggregate that, standardize it, so we can look, look at data as an asset, information as an asset? And we're investing very heavily to make that capability available to you very, very soon. The second component is global reach, one to many on a global basis. And you've probably heard about our recent announcement of a letter of intent to merge our OneSync data pool with SA2 WorldSync, the largest data pool in Europe. And then the third is around availability, making our traditional GS1 reference data available through APIs that any solution provider can access very easily. Our reference data for uh, global location numbers for G10s. Shifting over to capture, we're working with the industry to set in place guidelines as to when and how to use different symbologies. So we avoid having multiple barcodes on the same package, which is confusing for trading partners and takes up valuable real estate on your package. And then on identify, two areas. The first is around global trade item number allocation. Balancing the need uh, to change G10s to manage data quality with the cost to the industry of doing that and working very hard to drive some consensus on that topic. And then secondly, striking partnerships with platform providers like eBay, who you're going to hear from in a moment, and helping them understand the value of leveraging and utilizing GS1 standards so we can have interoperability between physical and digital commerce. Because as Amit says in eBay, there's no physical and digital commerce, it's just commerce. And you'll hear him talk about that a little bit. So we think that's very important to make sure that we don't create another standard when the existing one will do. So what I'd like to do now is, uh, is share with you uh, some market research we've been doing around uh, consumer behavior and how are the consumers dealing with some of these new trends in B2B2C. And then afterwards, uh, we'll be joined on the stage by our three panelists, and we can get going with the panel discussion. So if we could go to the video, please, that'd be great. Until recently, communicating with me about your product was pretty straightforward. 
You control what you wanted people like me to know. Your voice came booming across the airways, into my living room, through my TV. And across the pages of my magazine. Sure, my neighbor might tell me what she thought. Or the salesperson at the store downtown. But your voice prevailed. That's all changed. Now everyone in the world is my neighbor. Every salesperson is my salesperson. A sea of information is at my fingertips. Good and bad. I have options. I choose who to listen to. I choose how and where and when. Based on what works for me. I want reliable. I want personal. I want easy. Okay. See if I can avoid falling off the stage here by taking this chair. So uh, let me introduce our panelists here. Uh, to my immediate right is Tim Dorgan, who is uh, from the Peapod organization and is responsible for a lot of the mobile activity recently the Peapod has been doing. Next to uh, Tim is Anita Balaraman at Walmart Labs, uh, who is responsible in leading a lot of the activity at Walmart Labs as far as how can we leverage what we're learning in the digital environment to make the shopping experience at Walmart um, unique and, and, uh, and uh, enjoyable for the consumer. And to my far right is Amit Menapaz, uh, Senior Director for uh, eBay. And uh, Amit has been working with us for a few months now, and very good to see you again. We were together in, in, uh, in Brussels. So I'm actually going to start with Tim. And Tim, if you would just uh, kind of level set us a little bit on what's happening at Peapod. Uh, you've been at this now for a number of years. Peapod was a real early adopter. Uh, 1996, I think, is when the first website went up. And uh, perhaps you can share a little bit about what's happening at Peapod. I, I'd be happy to. Actually, the first website did go up in 96, but the company was founded in 1989, which makes it a very, very old internet company. Um, and I think there, there's an interesting and a hopefully a funny story about how the company got its name. It's a, to the point about trivia, this will be a good answer to a trivia question. But the two brothers that founded the company were Andrew and Thomas Parkinson. And they always wanted to start a business. And back in their teenage years, they came up with an idea for a company that was going to be called Parkinson Product One Design, PPOD, or Peapod. So time passed, and then they realized they wanted to start a business that would fundamentally improve people's lives through technology. And they decided that was going to be the grocery business that would also enable an information services business. So that company was going to be called Information and Products on Demand, IPOD iPod. And they got together and said, that is one lousy name. No one will ever remember that name. But we've got this PPOD thing. Let's just stretch it out and, and call it Peapod. So that's what the company was named, founded in 1989. And we've been in the grocery business, the online grocery business ever since. Today, we are the largest local delivery e-grocer in the US. What distinguishes us is we deliver the full grocery store. We deliver fresh, frozen, dry grocery to households in the Northeast United States, really all along the Eastern Seaboard, as well as in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Southern Wisconsin. We're a wholly owned division of Ahold USA. We go to market as Peapod in Chicago, Peapod by Stop and Shop in the Northeast, and Peapod by Giant in the Mid-Atlantic. To date, we've delivered 20 million orders, a billion products, those are good boxcar numbers. But the most important thing are the logistics, the product quality, and all the e-commerce skills that we've developed along the way. The technology is, is important, but what's most important is that the ice cream shows up at your door frozen, the bread isn't crushed, the bananas are green if you ordered green bananas, and that takes a lot of logistical uh, skills, as you might imagine, and that's where we're at today. One of the latest developments, and Bob alluded to it, was our commitment to mobile. We launched our iPhone and Android apps uh, late in 2010, uh, early in 2011, we launched our iPad app, and it's had a, a quantum impact on our business. At this point, about 20% of Peapod orders are touched by one mobile session. Generally, it takes two or three sessions for somebody to top their order off, and what's happening is they're starting their order on the PC, and then while they're out at their kid's soccer game, wherever, they think, you know what, I need bananas, I need this, I need that, and they're pulling out that mobile device and adding those items. And that's been a key driver in our business over the last 16 months. Voice recognition is part of it, but I would say 
that's sort of a minor part. The scanning of items, the adding items to the list has really been the key in increasing our basket size. Now the latest thing, and if you've been reading the trades at all, hopefully this isn't a secret, but we have launched our first virtual store. We actually launched it in Philadelphia at uh, transit stops in the Philadelphia metro area. And at these stops, and what you're seeing here is the latest version of this, which is in a Chicago subway station underneath the city. And consumers are invited, if they don't have our app, to download it. But then importantly, with all these items and many, many categories and many, many CPG companies represented, they can then use their phone to scan a barcode and add those items to their order. And that barcode is at the heart of what we're doing here. And as was mentioned earlier, there is no patience if it returns the wrong data. It's got to be the right image, the right price, in our case, the right ingredients, information, the right serving suggestions. All those things have to be spot on. And as I said, digital assets are critical to success. And we have a sister company called Item Master that has really taken upon themselves as their mission to create a, an open source repository for CPG graphics and data. And that data is becoming bigger and bigger as consumer expectations rise. It's not only ingredient information, uh, nutritional information, which is very important, but it's going to be video. It's going to be ratings and reviews. All that linked to the barcode and everything that Item Master is doing is uh, consistent with GS1 standards. And this partnership between us and Item Master is becoming more and more important as consumers are carrying more of these handheld devices around and, and hopefully adding to their Peapod order. And that's my story. That's your story. So <laughs> we'll, we'll turn it quickly over to Anita, and perhaps you can talk about at Walmart Labs, which a lot of people may not be so familiar with, and, and how you're uh, translating a lot of the learnings from what's happening online back into the store environment. So that'd be great. Thanks, Bob. Um, so quick introduction. Um, hope you can hear me. So my name is Anita Balaraman, and I'm a principal product manager at Walmart Labs. I, some of the products I manage at Labs are um, preparing, doing, you know, kind of um, coming up with global services that work on a global platform that enables multi-channel e-commerce, which is where Walmart is going. So maybe I can tell you a little bit about what Walmart Labs is and how it got started. It um, was formed by the Cosmics acquisition in May of 2011. Um, it was led by Venki and Anand, and um, they were the e-commerce pioneers and former Amazon executives. Um, Walmart Labs is about 200 people, big team, and growing every day. Uh, we have offices in San Bruno and also in Bangalore and in India. The vision, the core vision of Walmart Labs is to make the buying and the merchandising better and smarter by using um, signals of consumer intent. And what I mean by signals is the different sources from which you get information on what the consumer intends to buy because marketing at its core is matching your uh, customer with what they want, their product. Um, so as uh, Bob had alluded to before and the video showed you before, the e-commerce landscape is rapidly changing, right? So we have um, some of the big initiators of this big change is uh, social media and the social networks and just an explosion of all types of mobile devices. So that has fundamentally changed the way people shop and also fundamentally changed the way retailers respond. Um, so today's marketplace in some ways is changing, so it kind of defies uh, what you call as the customer intent. Earlier you had a very linear progression of consumer behavior, the whole buying funnel and whatnot, and that's morphed in some ways into a continuous process of uh, exploration. So the customer is constantly exploring and using the web to get information about the product. Well, the information that the customer is getting comes from a variety of sources, just because of the explosion in mobile devices and also social networks. When you get information from multiple sources, <laughs> they're not always going to say the same thing. And, um, and it's critical that there be a consistent message of the product to the consumer to provide that seamless uh, experience to them. So getting the right information to the customer in a consistent way, something that's consistent with the brand image, um, and also making sure that um, 
they deliver a positive customer experience is critical. So a lot of what Walmart Labs has been doing is making sure that there is that consistency in the information that's provided by being able to harness the information that comes from multiple mobile devices. Um, and that's exactly where how GS1 standards fit in, right? So when you have information coming from these different sources, they all need to tie in back in some way um, using their GTIN numbers and whatnot. Um, this makes the process a lot more efficient in the sense uh, e-commerce has gone from 1.0 where you had um, taking the store to the web and it's morphed into 2.0 where we're taking the web to the store, creating that seamless experience. So if that's the case, we have the same vendors and uh, sometimes same business partners serving two different areas or two different different partners serving the online versus the store, the brick and mortar ones. So having the process become a lot more efficient um, from our suppliers and partners all the way to the end customer is where GS1 standards fits in. And then ensuring that you have the appropriate product, the right product. Um, so say you're a customer that gets in to the store and creating that seamless online and offline um, experience, it requires that you have the right information and the right product, whether it is on your virtual shelf or whether it is on the store shelf. Um, and helping that collaboration between your trading partners, that's where GS1 actually fits in. Um, now this is an image of what Walmart's vision is and a lot of the services that I refer to that I'm working on help support this vision. So this is a vision of what um, we call as the endless aisle. <laughs> so you don't have an aisle on the virtual store that ends right there and then this is where it begins. It's almost like whether you're shopping online or whether you're in the retail store, you can get the same product and the same information and it kind of blends and merges in a, in a hopefully cohesive way. And that has led us to develop a bunch of um, products uh, which are actually aimed at things like self-service. For instance, we, we've, we've found out from statistics that about over 40% of the Walmart shoppers have smartphones. So using the smartphones in some ways to enable self-service, um, optimize their store visits, you know, come up with their lists and optimize it. The second one was create a very personal shopping uh, experience. How we do that is by tapping into some of their social networks to offer product recommendations which are very specific and personal. And the third is delivering a unique, uh, uh, unique multi-channel experience. And what that means for Walmart is everyday low prices and how the customer can be guaranteed of everyday low prices regardless of which channel they shop through. So those are so, and that's, that's our vision for um, you know, most of the products that we're working on right now. That's to you. So now we'll turn it over to Amit. Perhaps you can uh, refresh the audience a little bit with what's happening in eBay. Sure. Um, I'll try to, uh, I'll be building on all of these uh, great suggestions already. I'll try and give you some, some sense of the business opportunity that eBay sees in all of this and some of the technologies we're investing in and why eBay is uh, such a big supporter of GS1, the industry standard, and I personally spend so much time on this. Um, my job is as close to a supply chain management uh, uh, um, president for eBay that would exist, given that all of the sellers and the diversity of categories don't really work as part of eBay, but work with eBay as a partner. Um, to get, uh, join in the game of trivia, I'll, I'll just ask one question about the history of eBay. Anybody know what the first product that was sold on eBay was? A, a broken laser pointer. This was the first time there was a sale online between an anonymous buyer and seller. They did not know one another, and they successfully exchanged product and money. And there were a few dozen items on the site. Today, as you can see in the slide, there are over 100 million buyers and sellers interacting across the globe in over 40 countries, $2,000 per second being transacted, and over 300 million items on the site. Actually, um, last Friday, it was 340 million. Uh, across 50,000 different categories of um, anything you can imagine and a few things that you can't. <laughs> the, uh, all this is running on a data warehouse that's roughly 100 times the size of the Library of Congress. So that is a snapshot of what eBay is today uh, across the world. Now, if we look forward as to where is commerce going, here are the things that we look at. So as what has traditionally been considered an e-commerce company, 
through to 2015, we're expecting e-commerce to grow to a $300 billion industry, which is great news, very rapid growth. But still, if you think about it, it's a fraction of the total commerce industry, which is, in the US, expected to grow to $4 trillion. The more interesting trend that we're focused on is what is referred to as cross-channel commerce. And you've heard some examples of that already today. You imagine that being the person who's doing their online research, selects their item, goes to the store in order to buy it, or conversely, people who treat the store to some extent as a showroom, and after they've finalized the selection of their product, sometimes from within the store using their mobile phone, finding a better price somewhere else. This is the trend that we think defines the future. What's driving this trend? In a word, consumers. Consumers have become spoiled. And they expect all of the benefits that they've experienced offline or online to go with them wherever they are. And to work no matter what mode and uh, mode of operation they choose to select. They may have their mobile phone with them, they may be sitting at a computer, they may be physically in the store, and they may have a combination of those devices with them depending on the situation. And in all cases, they still expect to be able to scan, pay, receive coupons, carry their wish lists, uh, all of these things to carry with them and for us to be aware of them personally and their interests and their, and their needs. Now, this drives a lot of technology complexity, especially for retailers, both large and small. And here, the three trends which you've already heard touched upon that eBay is investing uh, a lot on is mobile, social, and local. Mobile, which started three years ago as a business that ran $2 billion through mobile, we're now expecting this year to have over $8 billion worth of merchandise purchased through mobile phones. So this is not a emerging trend, it is an existing fact, okay? In social, we are releasing applications such as uh, group gifting, which is a mashup between eBay, PayPal, and Facebook to allow people, uh, friends and family, to get together to buy something together for somebody that they care about, all seamlessly through these multi-format devices. With local, the goal is to take all of the offline inventory and make it visible online. If you think about it, for small local shops uh, who have whatever fan base they have in their local community, they're effectively invisible online. Even if they were to set up a website, the ability for them to drive traffic to their website in competition with everything else going on is very limited. By incorporating them into our channels, both on the site and off the site, across all of the different channels that we use, we make them suddenly available both nationally and internationally to audiences they, don't even, they haven't even thought about yet. And for large retailers, there's a benefit that at, be at the beginning was considered a threat. Up until now, retailers have been looking at the online commerce piece and saying, I don't want to compete online because price comparison is easy, there's a disadvantage that we have since we have this national footprint and all of this capital investment. How are we possibly going to compete on price? I don't even want to compete on price we're actually offering them an ability to steal back some of that share. Why? Because when people see that they have alternatives that are local to them, that national footprint becomes an advantage because people make a choice sometimes to pay a little bit more for instant gratification because they forgot the birthday present and they need it now, because there are certain uh, personalized services that can be available in the store in the neighborhood for the people who are there, and because there are a lot of services that stores can offer that online you can't, such as installation or customization of the products. So, all of that blends into an offer of eBay as a partner to sellers of all sizes and shapes to try and cope with this technology whirlwind. As consumers, uh, try to interact with all of the product data in the way that's most meaningful to them. eBay is trying to make the investments necessary for the retailers and the brands and the manufacturers to focus on designing, making, and customizing the products and services. And then making sure that they are available consistently across every channel. 
and we can share that inventory locally, nationally, internationally, across all of the different modes and formats. And where there are sellers who are tech savvy or even developers who are competing to create uh, for certain niches special, unique shopping experiences we haven't even invented yet, they now have access through xCommerce to all of the assets that eBay has invested in in order to give them an opportunity to leverage that. First and foremost, related to the topic of today, is the product catalog, in which we have over 40 million products today, but only about half of them with the GTN information. So why would you provide GTN information to eBay? In a, the short answer is because it tells us what you're promoting. But let me turn that into some practical implications to your distribution channels. When we know exactly what you're selling, and we know that the information is correct, we are able to do many things in order to promote the business that sells these products. We're able to drive more traffic to those products. We're able to share those, that inventory contextually targeted to people both on the site and off the site. We're able to share it through mobile and social, and if we don't have that information, we don't share. So all of that business is an opportunity cost that's being lost by people who don't provide us that information. And having a trusted source of data is something that eBay and as a platform, and I think you've heard it from the other, the, my other peers here as well, is necessary for this entire thing to get to a, an entire new scale of operation. And as eBay, as a partner to sellers, we're also willing to share and contribute, which is why we're so excited to be working with the industry standard. So my call to action would be for uh, all of the people in this audience, and I understand these are primarily supply chain people in various different categories, all of which we embrace, to go back home, and when you get to your offices, find the peers in your marketing departments and walk over to them and tell them these stories and explain to them that they are missing out on sales. They are missing out on sales. When we don't get the information, we'll guess, and based on our automatic systems, we'll get, we usually term it in terms of 95% precision and 80% recall on average, which means when we make a guess, we may be 5% wrong. That is very bad for everybody, buyers and sellers and the platform. And 20% of the things we don't find. 20% of the time, it's just sitting there, a missed opportunity to sell your product. So go back and share that with the marketing departments and tell them that as you're using the GTINs in order to carry things through the supply chain, you wouldn't send a product without its packaging and its instructions out to the retail shop, a consumer gets a hold of it and hope that they'll get that information some other way. This information is necessary to be coming through the supply chain all the way through altogether and requires us all to work more closely and more in a more coordinated fashion. And I'd say that that would be the most important thing that could happen coming out of today. Thank you, Amit. That's great. And thank you, Anita and, and Tim as well. And I should note that all three of these companies have been a part of the GS1 uh, B2C Alliance that we started about a year and a half ago uh, to foster and begin this dialogue with different stakeholders along all of the supply chain. Um, you all talked about the use of mobile that's happening, and you talked about the importance of information integrity. Tim, I, I just wanted to ask you, what, from your perspective, what do you think brand owners could do to help uh, solve this problem more urgently, um, given the importance to the online business? Well, I think as a start, they need to recognize, I think, the upside of this. Uh, I don't know, I can't speak for your businesses, but the mobile volume that we're getting is incremental. Incremental volume in the grocery business is tough to come by. And if the manufacturers with whom we're working are not you know, working with Item Master and making sure that there is a, uh, a trusted source of data linked to the UPC code that will deliver that information really at the point of decision. And that point of decision is in a subway station. It's, at, you know, it's in a lot of different places it never was before. If you're not participating in that, then you're missing out on incremental volume, and that's tough to come by. Amit, just a, a question for you around um, the, the, the change in consumer behavior with mobile and, uh, and how you're seeing that affect your business. Perhaps you can talk a little bit more about how that's putting, per your Commerce 3.0, uh, 
uh, slide, how that's putting a lot of pressure on your business model, and again, how brand owners can help you with that. Yeah, so um, uh, the form factor of mobile, okay, is limited. In other words, one of the key challenges there is how do you get the minimum amount of information for people to know um, that they're making the right decision? And there, really, what you want to get to is a point where they actually don't have to look at most of the information because they trust it. Because when you get there, then you have things like one-click purchases. When you get there, then you can link all of the other benefits in a very confident way. When you get there, you can make recommendations and defaults for people that save them time and make all of that frictionless. And so as that business grows, and it's been growing exponentially over the past few years, um, and we integrated more seamlessly with every other mode uh, and channel, the, the, the criticality of having that trusted, um, unique identifier with the related product information, should somebody choose to verify what they're looking at, okay, becomes the difference between success and failure of the experience. Anita, maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, given the rapid adoption of that technology by consumers, mobile, even among older shoppers, um, how that may be changing the shopping patterns, how that's changing the shopping behavior, both online and offline um, at sure. Walmart. So most of our shoppers, like I mentioned, over 40% of them seem to have smartphones, and uh, more than half of them seem to do their online research or get multiple sources of information before they actually come to the store, or we have programs where they, you can pick up from the store or ship it to the store or buy it and have it delivered various forms thereof. So when you're transcending from one channel to the other, even for some of the traditional uh, Walmart shoppers who become familiar going to the brick and mortar stores and getting the brand product that they actually trust, getting um, other sources of information, whether from their social networks or whatnot, keeping the identity of the brand becomes even more critical. Are we still talking about the same product over here with all these features as it pertains to you know, this specific Apple, iPhone, whatever, or are we talking about a different uh, Samsung variety? Whatever it be. But that, that part of it becomes a lot more critical for them, especially when you're transcending across and having even the traditional shoppers actually get a lot of their product information through various sources prior to actually making the purchase enabled, of course, clearly through your mobile phones or your iPads or whatnot. Amit, just a question for you, and I love your call to action, and it's one that certainly uh, uh, touches our hearts at GS1 because we're trying to help tell the story about crossing the aisle to the demand side and uh, asking many people who have, who have really experienced the, the power of GS1 standards in the B2B space to try to translate that story with our help over to the demand side. What do you think some of the barriers are? Um, I mean, I, I, we, 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 you know, when you see the opportunity, the revenue opportunity, Tim, to your point, and we see how important the information is to that consumer behavior, what do you think is getting in the way of, of getting that data to be available? So uh, three barriers that I encounter often um, include the following. First of all, what seems to be a fairly trivial one but often gets in our way is simply organizational structure. So oftentimes, the people who appreciate the power of this uh, are sitting on the supply chain, chain side. Uh, the people who are working on the product marketing material have their own uh, systems, uh, uh, files, you know, uh, uh, um, standards, and ways of working. And, and they, don't, they don't really intersect. And um, when, when I speak to, to um, when I try to, the, the way that we try to get around that is simply offer them to share with us the information any way they like. They don't have to think about it. If they, if they have it in a digitized form, and sometimes not even digitized, in any form whatsoever, we're happy to help start working with them on that just as an effort to start to generate that kind of recognition and activity. Um, I think that's one trivial but important piece. Second piece has to do with um, some sense of uh, uh, loss of control of the information. And, and there, um, they, there is a uh, there's a protection for the distribution channel where they say here are our authorized uh, dealers and resellers and they are the ones who get the information and we don't want the information to get out of our hands into multiple other places. And to that, I simply explain that there really is no control over that. If it's gone onto the internet, you now have no control anymore of what's going on. I promise you that, for example, I'll speak just for eBay, uh, all that information is being fed back into the system from our various sellers 
many of them who are not necessarily in your official distribution channel, and that information is being represented in many different ways. How much better would it be if you would engage that actively by providing that information and not worrying too much about how it's going to be uh, changed? You'd be surprised at what kind of business opportunities arise from sharing more information into places and channels you may not have explored before. Um, one uh, corollary to that I use often is um, in Apple with iTunes. Uh, they didn't try to stop the existence of every other form of, um, uh, in the music industry of that song. They simply provided a simple, consistent, uh, and, uh, and easy, uh, easily accessible by consumers uh, format to go. And most people went and interacted with that. Uh, but it didn't require controlling and enforcing the entire industry in order to get that started. Um, and then uh, the, the final part, I think, is lack of um, clear understanding of the business case. Uh, the business case is enormous. Uh, I think that really uh, the experience that people have you know, within their offline uh, experience uh, keeps them very much in the areas where they, they feel comfortable. Um, there are pockets in every company that treat the online marketing piece as a side piece. It's you know, currently whatever, two, three, five percent of their business, and don't recognize that there is no difference between online and offline. And therefore, if they're doing something right offline, they should be doing that as right online. And if they really recognize that connection, they would be running to the, these groups in order to, whether it's the supply chain or the online marketing people, in order to help them get that information out the door. So I just want to add to that the last part, specifically the lack of awareness. So we see that a lot, especially if you have a partner who serves your brick and mortar stores. And there is not a lot of rich information that is typically provided for a product that's sold um, through the, your stores. And, and so not being aware of the need to actually provide that information that translate and transcend so you don't have this aisle that ends at the store and then not, you know, another aisle that begins on your website. So being able to see that translate all the way through and providing that information is one of them. The second is to do with uh, marketplace partners. That could be any, any mom, pop who wants to sell something as, you know, as a vendor through our uh, online site. Oftentimes they don't, I think, realize the importance of having even a UPC or a JITIN, for example, which then is their little key to unlock a whole bunch of information that's going to help create the demand for their products. So I, I think the last part is pretty critical. If I could just add one thing too, in, in terms of inhibitors to companies supporting this, I think there's a general underappreciation for the appetite that consumers have for more and more relevant information. Um, we have some CPG partners who provide a lot and some that don't. And even for the most mundane product, I remember back in 1996, for the first time Peapod had a graphic image of every single item in its database, about 10,000 grocery products at the time. And which product do you think was clicked on the most to get a product image and nutritional information? It was Campbell's chicken noodle soup. You'd think people would know what that looked like. <laughs> but even then, there's a curiosity. And today, of course, it goes much deeper than that. So I don't think we should underestimate the appetite that consumers have for more and more information about the products that they consume. I can also add one other aspect people don't think about. We talk a lot about mobile, but really it's about the seamless integration. You mentioned multi-channel and only-channel between the offline and online. So if you imagine, I mean, right now I can't think of a, a bus stop or a billboard that doesn't have a QR code or some other reference, okay? Um, what that's doing, okay, is creating sharing of information across platforms. And without the use of the GTIN, that really gets blocked. You don't get that opportunity to share all that rich information. And each format has its own special use. And so what you can't do on a billboard, you can do you know, on the computer and, and on your mobile. And that kind of sharing can't happen unless you embrace this connection. So Amit, Anita, Tim, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this has been really insightful. Hopefully the audience enjoyed it. And uh, I think your comments are, are really relevant to the future that lies ahead of us. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to a close uh, of our second chapter that we talked about in the panel. And, um, 
I, I guess my closing comments to you would be simply, please get involved. Uh, we're only as strong as all the support and the participation that we have from all of you, the industry partners, and hopefully what you've heard about this afternoon in our five industry verticals or from the panelists in the B2B space whets your appetite and uh, causes you to get more involved in everything that we're doing at GS1 US. Tomorrow, please don't miss Biz Stone, uh, co-founder of Twitter that's going to be speaking tomorrow afternoon. Have a great conference. Thank you.